We're continuing to study spinners from a mathematical point of view, and in this video we're going to discuss the difference between Pauli spinners, Weyl spinners, and Dirac spinners. The short answer is that Pauli spinners are two-component objects associated with 3D space. Weyl spinners are two-component objects associated with 4D space-time, and Dirac spinners are four-component spinners associated with 4D space-time made up of a left chiral vial spinner and a right chiral vial spinner stacked on top of each other. We've spent the last few videos discussing Pauli spinners in detail. In this video we're going to discuss all the differences between Pauli spinners and vial spinners. Once we understand the two component vial spinners, it will be very easy to understand the four component Dirac spinners since a Dirac spinner is simply a pair of vial spinners. To begin, I'm going to give an overview of all the differences between Pauli spinners and vial spinners, and then I'll spend the rest of this video exploring the differences in detail. In 3D space, we calculate the squared length of a vector using Pythagoras' theorem x squared plus y squared plus z squared. In 4D spacetime, we instead calculate the square of the spacetime interval, s squared, which is time squared minus the space components squared. The length of 3D vectors is held constant during rotations, done with SO3 matrices. The spacetime interval of 4D spacetime vectors is held constant when we do Lorentz transformations done with SO13 matrices. We can rewrite 3D vectors as 2x2 two two matrices called Pauli vectors, and we can rewrite 4D spacetime vectors as 2x2 two two matrices called Weyl vectors. Pauli vectors are rotated with double-sided transformations with SU2 matrices. Weyl vectors are Lorentz transformed with double-sided transformations with SL2C matrices. Pauli vectors can be factored into a pair of Pauli spinners, and Weyl vectors can be factored into a pair of Weyl spinners. The inner product of Pauli spinners is Xi dagger Xi, but the inner product of Weyl spinners is Xi transpose times the epsilon matrix times Xi. Pauli spinners don't have a notion of chirality, but Weyl spinners can be either left chiral or right chiral. Finally, Pauli spinners have two types of indices, four spinners and dual spinners. Vial spinners have four types of indices, for the left and right versions of spinners and dual spinners. To begin, let's do a quick review of special relativity. If this review goes too fast, I've included some links in the description that cover special relativity more slowly. In Galilean relativity, a space-time diagram with time along the vertical axis looks like a sequence of photographs that change as we move up along the time axis. We can change our frame of reference just by sliding these photographs left and right. This means that light beams can have any speed in Galilean relativity, because changing our reference frame will change the speed of light. Special relativity postulates that the speed of light c is the same in all inertial reference frames. This means we need a new way to change our frame of reference that keeps these two beams of light unchanged. The key to changing reference frames while keeping the speed of light constant is squashing spacetime along one beam of light and extending it along the other beam of light. This change of coordinates is called a Lorentz boost and it is given by this formula here. It can also be written with hyperbolic trig functions. So Lorentz boosts are actually hyperbolic rotations. You'll also notice I've written the time variable as the speed of light c times time. This is a common convention in special relativity, because it gives time units of distance which allows us to treat time and space together on equal footing in space-time. This brings us to the first topic in this chart, comparing length in 3D space to the space-time interval in 4D space-time. In 2D physical space, we measure length using the Pythagoras formula, involving a sum of squares, 
x squared plus y squared equals r squared. A curve of constant r is called a circle, and r is the circle's radius. In 2D spacetime, we measure a distance like quantity using the formula involving a difference of squares. Time squared minus space squared equals s squared, where s is called the spacetime interval. A curve of constant s is called a hyperbola. Unlike length squared, which is either positive or zero, s squared can also be negative. When s squared is positive, we call it a time-like hyperbola. When s squared is negative, we call it a space-like hyperbola. When s squared is zero, the time coordinate equals the space coordinate, and this traces out the straight line paths of light beams. These curves have many different names, such as null, isotropic, or light-like curves. In three-dimensional space, the squared length formula looks like this. And in four-dimensional space-time, the space-time interval squared formula looks like this. Next, we'll talk about the matrices used to rotate in 3D space and Lorentz transform in 4D space-time. In 3D space, the squared length of a vector v is given by v transpose v. A transformation r that keeps the length constant must satisfy r transpose equals r inverse. We say r belongs to the group O3, the 3x3 three three orthogonal matrices. These include both rotations with determinant plus 1 and reflected rotations with determinant minus 1. If we want to restrict ourselves to rotations only, we force the determinant to be plus 1. We call these transformations SO3, the 3x3 three three special orthogonal matrices. A rotation always pushes points along a circle in a plane, which is defined by a pair of variables. We can find all the basic rotation types by looking at all the possible pairs of coordinate variables which are x, y, y, z, and z, x. So there are three basic types of rotations, which are done with matrices involving cosines and sines. In 4D spacetime, the squared spacetime interval of a vector w is given by w transpose eta w, where eta is this matrix called the Minkowski metric. Multiplying this out gives the familiar time squared minus space squared formula we saw earlier. A transformation lambda that keeps s squared constant must satisfy lambda transpose eta lambda equals eta. We say lambda belongs to the group O13, the orthogonal group in one time dimension and three space dimensions. If we want to ignore spatial reflections, we force the determinant to be plus 1, which gives us the special orthogonal group SO13. If we want to forbid reflections in time, which swaps the past and the future, we also need to demand that the top left member of the lambda matrix is positive. This is called the orthochronous condition, denoted with a plus. These transformations that keep S squared constant are called Lorentz transformations. Basic Lorentz transformations also take place in a plane, defined by a pair of variables. We can find all basic Lorentz transformations by looking at all possible pairs of coordinate variables. These are x, y, y, z, z, x, t, x, t, y, and t, z. So there are six basic Lorentz transformations. Three of these are the 3D spatial rotations we've already seen. The other three are Lorentz boosts, which move us to a new reference frame with some constant velocity. In our S squared formula, if we set time and the third space coordinate to zero, we get the familiar equation of a circle, and we rotate circles using cosines and sines, with matrices like these. But we also have three boosts, which match up the time variable and a space variable. If we set two of the space variables to zero, we get the equation of a hyperbola.
we transform hyperbolas with Lorentz boosts, also called hyperbolic rotations, with hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. These are given by these matrices here. So let's start our comparison between Pauli spinners and vial spinners by talking about vial vectors. With 3D vectors, we found that if we replaced the basis vectors by Pauli matrices, we ended up with a 2x2 two two matrix called a Pauli vector, which is another way of representing a 3D vector. For 4D spacetime vectors, we do something similar, except we replace the time basis vector with the identity matrix, which I'm writing as this fancy number 1. This can also be written as sigma t or sigma 0. This gives us a 2x2 two two matrix representation of a 4D spacetime vector. I've never seen this matrix given an official name, so for this video series I'm going to call it a vial vector. Now, how do we know this is the correct way of representing a 4D spacetime vector as a 2x2 two two matrix? Well, for Pauli vectors, when we took the determinant, we got the formula for the negative squared length of the vector. Let's see what happens when we take the determinant of a vial vector. We get two products, which we can distribute, and since these inner terms cancel, we get time squared minus the squares of the three space components. This equals the square of the space-time interval for this vector. So this is a good indication that our vial vector is the correct way of representing a space-time vector as a 2x2 two two matrix, because its determinant tells us the vector's space-time interval. Now let's consider the double-sided transformation of vial vectors. Now we know that 3D vectors rotate with SO3 matrices, and in video number 6 in this series, we learned that we can do an equivalent rotation on Pauli vectors by acting on it with a double-sided transformation of SU2 matrices, the special unitary 2x2 two two matrices. These matrices each do half the rotation, and so they use half angles of theta over 2. It's worth asking if we can do something similar in space-time. We know 4D space-time vectors can be Lorentz transformed with SO13 matrices. If we rewrite our space-time vectors as 2x2 two two vial vectors, we can ask if there's a similar double-sided transformation that we can do to achieve Lorentz transformations. We knew that Pauli vectors were Hermitian, and so they should remain Hermitian after a 3D rotation, with a double-sided transformation involving matrices A and B. This led us to conclude that B must equal A dagger, the Hermitian conjugate of A. And so a Pauli vector V is rotated using the transformation AVA dagger. Vial vectors are also Hermitian, and so if we do a Lorentz transformation using a double-sided matrix transformation, the result should also be Hermitian. And we conclude we Lorentz transform a vial vector W using the transformation AWA dagger. We also knew that the determinant of a Pauli vector is the vector's negative squared length. Since rotations don't change the length of a vector, we concluded that the determinant of the A matrix must have magnitude 1. We also saw that these double-sided transformations allow for arbitrary phase shifts in the A matrix without changing the rotation result. So it was always possible to pick a phase shift that sets the determinant of A to positive 1. The determinant of a vial vector is the square of the vector's space-time interval, which is unchanged under Lorentz transformations. So we can also conclude that the determinant of A has magnitude 1, in the case of Lorentz transforming vial vectors. And we can force this determinant to be plus 1 using the phase shift property. Finally, we observed that Pauli vectors had zero trace, and we used this fact to prove that the transformation matrices on Pauli vectors must be unitary. However, vial vectors can have non-zero trace, so we cannot guarantee that the matrices transforming vial vectors are unitary.
So Pauli vectors rotate with this double-sided transformation. I'm going to rewrite the A matrix as U for clarity. U is a 2 by 2 matrix with determinant plus 1, so it is special. The matrix is also unitary. So Pauli vectors rotate with special unitary 2 by 2 matrices, also called SU2 matrices. Vial vectors are Lorentz transformed with a double-sided transformation, and I'm going to rewrite the A matrix as L for clarity. L is a 2 by 2 matrix with determinant plus 1, so the matrix is special. But there is no requirement for these transformation matrices to be unitary. So these are the special linear 2 by 2 matrices SL2. Since we're dealing with complex numbers, we often write a letter C to tell us that the matrix elements are complex instead of real. So vial vectors are Lorentz transformed with double-sided transformations with SL2C matrices. In video number 6, we found that SU2 matrices are defined by two complex numbers, alpha and beta. This gives us four real numbers. But since the determinant is plus 1, this gives one additional real constraint, reducing the number of free parameters to three real numbers. This corresponds to the three possible rotations in 3D space. If we look at an SL2C matrix, we have four complex numbers, or eight real numbers. But since the determinant is forced to be plus 1, this gives us two additional real constraints, where the determinant's magnitude must be 1 and its phase must be 0. This reduces the number of free parameters to six real numbers. This corresponds to the three possible rotations and three possible boosts in 4D spacetime. Recall from video number 6 that we could get SU2 matrices using these half-angle formulas involving cosine and sine. We just multiply the sine term by a pair of sigmas that indicate the plane of rotation. We can do something similar for boosts, but using hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine. And we multiply the sine h term using sigma t, which is the identity matrix, and the sigma for the direction we're boosting in. Now let's talk about factoring these 2 by 2 matrices into spinners. With Pauli vectors, we found that it was sometimes possible to factor them into a column and a row, called Pauli spinners, with the column being a spinner and the row being a dual spinner. There were multiple solutions to this factoring, since we could always get a new solution if we multiplied the column by a number k and multiplied the row by 1 over k. But the most straightforward solution is given by these formulas. However, we found this factoring could only be done if the determinant of the matrix was 0. And in order for this factoring to be done, we need either all the xyz components to be 0, or at least some of them to be complex numbers. It's impossible to do this factoring if all the components are real and non-zero. Now let's try factoring a vial vector into a column and a row, which will require the determinant to be 0. Since the space-time interval formula contains both positive and negative terms, it's possible to make the space-time interval equal 0 using only real components, so complex numbers are not required. Remember, the space-time interval equaling 0 means the vector is null, or isotropic, also called light-like, since it points along the direction of travel of a light beam in space-time. So let's take a vial vector and assume its determinant, the square of the space-time interval, is 0. We'll also assume all the components are real numbers. In order to factor it into a column and a row, we need to solve for these values a, b, c, d. Multiplying the column by the row, and comparing the results with the matrix entries, we get these four equations. Now remember, all four space-time components are real numbers, so time plus z must be real. This means that a times c must be real as well.
The only way for this to be true is if C equals the complex conjugate of A times some real factor K1. We also know that time minus Z must be real. So D must equal the complex conjugate of B times some real factor K2. Looking at the other two equations, we see that the right hand sides are complex conjugates of each other. Which means that the left sides must also be complex conjugates of each other. If we sub in our formulas for C and D, we can cancel A and B conjugate. And that gives us K1 equals K2, since they are both real. The real number K is just an arbitrary scaling factor that we can set to 1. Basically, if a vector points in a light-like direction with a space-time interval 0, multiplying it by a scale factor won't change the direction, and it will still have a space-time interval of 0. So we'll just take k equals 1 for simplicity. But we still need to solve for the complex numbers a and b. Given these four formulas, notice that if we add the first two together, the time components add and the z components cancel. If we divide by 2, we get a formula for time in terms of a and b. We can get an equation for z if we subtract the two formulas instead. And we can get similar formulas for x and y by adding and subtracting the other two formulas. So this gives us the spacetime components in terms of the spinner components. But how do we get the spinner components from the spacetime components? We can think of the complex numbers a and b as each being defined by a magnitude and a phase. From equation 1, we see the magnitude of a is the square root of time plus z. Likewise, from equation 2, the magnitude of b is the square root of time minus z. From equation 3, let's divide both sides by the magnitudes of a and b, which we can rewrite as these square roots on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, a complex number divided by its magnitude just gives its phase. Combining the exponents, this gives us the phase difference between a and b. On the right-hand side, we can multiply the square roots to get the square root of time squared minus z squared. For a null vector, this also equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. So even though there are four real numbers in this spinner, we can only solve for three, the two magnitudes and one phase difference. This is because the four spacetime components for a null vector only have three free parameters. The fourth parameter is determined by the other three. So we can only get three parameters for the spinners. Any overall phase factor will get cancelled out when we multiply the spinners together, so overall phase factors don't impact the final result. So we've successfully factored a null vial vector into a vial spinner and a dual vial spinner. From now on, I'll label the components of a vial spinner as psi1 and psi2, with upper indices. If we rotate a Pauli vector using a pair of SU2 matrices, and then factor our Pauli vector into a pair of Pauli spinners, we see that the column spinner rotates with a single half-angle SU2 matrix acting from the left. And we see that our row dual spinner transforms with the Hermitian conjugate of this half-angle SU2 matrix acting from the right. Similarly, if we Lorentz transform a vial vector using a double-sided SL2C transformation and then factor it into a pair of vial spinners, we see that the column spinner transforms with a single SL2C matrix from the left. And the row dual spinner transforms with the Hermitian conjugate of this SL2C matrix from the right. Now let's talk about inner products. Loosely speaking, the inner product of two vectors tells us the angle between them, and the inner product of a vector with itself tells us the vector's squared length. The reason inner products are useful is that they don't change under rotations. For example, if we take the inner product of vectors u and v, written u transpose v, and rotate them both with an SO3 matrix R, 
Since the transpose of an SO3 matrix equals its inverse, these cancel to the identity, meaning the inner product is unchanged. Similarly, if we take two Pauli spinners, Xi and Chi, and take their inner product, Xi dagger Chi, when we rotate them with SU2 matrices, we end up with U dagger U in the middle. And since U is unitary, U dagger equals U inverse. So these cancel to the identity, meaning the inner product is unchanged. Now, if we take two vial spinners, psi and phi, we might hope that psi dagger phi is unchanged under Lorentz transformations. But this turns out to be not true. If we transform our vial spinners with an SL2C matrix called L, this is not guaranteed to be unitary. So this L dagger L in the middle will not always be the identity matrix. So this is not a good inner product for vial spinners, and we need a new inner product formula. The inner product is often written as a row times a column, but we can get more interesting inner products if we put a matrix in the middle between them. For example, the inner product in flat spacetime uses this matrix here, with a positive one and three negative ones along the diagonal. This matrix is called the Minkowski metric, and is usually written as eta. We can try to find a similar matrix epsilon that goes in between a pair of vial spinners, which will give us a good inner product. If I Lorentz transform the spinners with an SL2C matrix L, and set the inner product equal to the original formula, I end up with the constraint that L dagger epsilon L must equal epsilon. It turns out that there is no epsilon matrix that will satisfy this formula for arbitrary L, so it doesn't give us a good inner product. However, if I start over and use psi transpose instead of psi dagger, I get the constraint L transpose epsilon L equals epsilon, and it turns out this can give us a good inner product. If I write this as a matrix equation, where L has components alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and churn through the matrix multiplications, I get four equations constraining the components of epsilon. These equations must be true for any choice of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, as long as their determinant equals one. Looking at equation one, the right-hand side only has the component epsilon one, one. This means epsilon two, two must go to zero. The middle term must also go to zero telling us that epsilon 2, 1 equals negative epsilon 1, 2. And finally, epsilon 1, 1 must also be 0, since the equation must be true for any alpha. So we have these constraints on the components of epsilon. The simplest solution is to pick epsilon 1, 2 equaling 1, which gives us this epsilon matrix here, with components 0, 1, negative 1, 0. So we've determined the correct inner product between vial spinners is psi transpose epsilon phi, where the epsilon matrix equals this. So for two Pauli spinners psi and chi, their inner product is psi dagger chi. Psi dagger is what we call the dual spinner of psi. The dual is like the left portion of an inner product. If xi is a column that lives in a spinner space, then xi dagger is a row that lives in the corresponding dual spinner space. We talked about this in the last video. For two vial spinners, psi and phi, their inner product is psi transpose epsilon phi. This psi transpose epsilon term is the dual spinner of psi. Again, the dual spinner is like the left half of the inner product. If psi is a column that lives in a spinner space, then psi transpose epsilon is a row that lives in the corresponding dual spinner space. So we know the vial spinner inner product must be unchanged after a Lorentz transformation. So L transpose epsilon L must equal epsilon. If we multiply both sides by L inverse on the right, we can cancel L and L inverse and see that L transpose epsilon can be replaced by epsilon L inverse.
This gives an alternate way of transforming the inner product, where the second half phi transforms with L, and the first half psi transpose epsilon transforms with L inverse. We'll talk about this more later in the video. It's also worth mentioning that the vial spinner inner product is anti-symmetric, and gets a negative sign when we swap the order of the spinners, and equals zero when we put the same spinner in twice. Because of this, the epsilon metric doesn't measure lengths and angles like most metrics. It is more correctly called a symplectic form, but I won't discuss that in this video. Next, I'm going to talk about chirality. For Pauli spinners, there's no notion of left chiral or right chiral spinners. But vial spinners come in two types, either left chiral or right chiral. The reason for this is that Pauli spinners transform with SU2 matrices, and there is only one version of SU2. But vial spinners transform with SL2C matrices, and there are two copies of SL2C matrices, called the left and right representations, and we can travel between them using complex conjugation. I'll show you what I mean. If we look at these two matrices, you might argue that they are different transformations. One rotates in the xy plane, and one rotates in the yz plane. But another interpretation is that they are the same physical transformation, just written in different coordinate systems. In these visualizations, the two physical rotations are the same, but the coordinate axes are different. To relate the two matrices, we can change coordinates with C, do the rotation with R, and then change coordinates back with C inverse. The result of these three operations is the matrix R tilde, which rotates in the tilde coordinate system. The same thing can happen with spinners. We can have two different SU2 matrices that end up doing the same physical transformation. They only look different because the matrices are used in different spinner coordinate systems. For example, it's possible that U and U complex conjugate represent the same physical transformation, just in different spinner coordinate systems. To show this, we just need to find a coordinate change C, which satisfies C, then U, then C inverse, equaling U complex conjugate. If we write the matrix big C with entries A, B, C, D, and go through the matrix multiplications, we get four equations, where I've written the determinant as capital D. Matching both sides of equation 2 tells us small c squared equals the determinant, and a squared equals 0. Doing the same thing with equation 3 tells us small d squared equals 0, and b squared equals the determinant. Plugging all this into the determinant formula tells us that b equals negative small c, so our coordinate change matrix big C looks like this. What this shows is that U and U complex conjugate can really be viewed as the same physical transformation, but represented in different spinner coordinate systems. It turns out that we cannot say the same thing for the SL2C matrices that transform vial spinners. It turns out that there is no change of coordinate matrix C, which satisfies C then L then C inverse, equaling L complex conjugate. This means that if we take the SL2C matrices we're familiar with, that do Lorentz transformations, and then complex conjugate them, we get an entirely new copy of SL2C, which is not the result of a change of coordinates. We call these two copies the left representation and the right representation. Left chiral vial spinners will transform with the left representation, and right chiral vial spinners will transform with the right representation. So unlike Pauli spinners, vial spinners come in left chiral and right chiral versions. Finally, let's go over the notation used for the components of vial spinners.
Now this next section of the video will involve the placement of indices on vial spinners. Unfortunately, there are so many different index conventions across multiple sources that the conventions you see in this video will probably be different than the ones you find in a textbook. So make sure to pay attention to the conventions of your textbook and how it differs from the conventions in this video. So we've already seen that there are ordinary vial spinners and dual vial spinners. And now we're saying that there are left chiral vial spinners and right chiral vial spinners. So there are actually four types of vial spinners in total. Left, left dual, right, and right dual. Each of these transform in their own way. Let's say that when we do a Lorentz transformation on space-time, the components of a left spinner psi transform with an SL2C matrix called L. In this video series, I'll denote left spinner components as columns with upper indices. The left dual of psi is given by psi transpose epsilon. Remember, this is just the other half of the inner product for vial spinners. If psi transforms with L from the left, then psi dual will transform with L inverse from the right. Remember, the entire point of the inner product is that it stays the same under a Lorentz transformation. So if one half transforms with L, the other half must transform with L inverse. In this video series, I denote left dual spinner components as rows with lower indices. If we take a left spinner and complex conjugate it, we call the result a right dual spinner. Right dual vial spinners transform with the complex conjugate of L. In this video series, I denote right dual spinners as columns with upper indices that have dots on top. If we look at the inner product of vial spinners and complex conjugate the formula, the second half psi star transforms like a right dual spinner with L complex conjugate. For the first half, we can rewrite epsilon star as epsilon since it's real. And the complex conjugate transpose can be written as a dagger. This must be a right spinner, which transforms with the complex conjugate of L inverse. This makes sense. If one half of the inner product transforms with L star, the other must transform with L star inverse. In this video series, I denote right spinners as rows with lower indices with dots on top. I've summarized all four of the different vial spinners along with their transformation rules and index notations here. This notation for the four types of vial spinners that use both the dotted and undotted indices is called van der Waarden notation. Now, I should mention something else. Here I've written the various vial spinners using a mix of columns and rows. Some sources prefer to write all vial spinners as columns only. To do this, we need to take the transpose of the vial spinners that I've written as rows. So if we take this transformation and take the transpose of both sides, this transposes everything inside the brackets, and also reverses the order. Now the transpose of epsilon is negative epsilon, but since we transpose epsilon on both sides, we get negative signs on both sides that cancel out, and we get this. So keep in mind how the transformation rules change when we take the transpose. So in the column only notation, the four transformations look like this. The reason we refer to left-handed and right-handed spinners is because they are related by mirror symmetry, just like left and right hands. We can reflect space in a mirror by sending the xyz basis vectors to the negative versions of themselves. If we do this, rotation transformations are unchanged, because rotation in the xy plane is unchanged when we reverse the x and y basis vectors. We can see this in our spinner transformation matrices as well, because when we flip the signs on the two sigmas, they cancel out, leaving the matrix unchanged.
When we look at how left and right spinners transform, we know that SU2 rotation matrices are unitary, so L inverse equals L dagger. This means that right chiral spinners rotate with L dagger dagger, which is just L, the exact same rotation that left chiral spinners rotate with. However, when it comes to Lorentz boosts, boosts are Hermitian, not unitary. If we take the Hermitian conjugate of 2x2 two two boost matrices, we get the exact same thing back. The reason for this is that the boost matrices only contain a single sigma matrix, and the sigma matrices are Hermitian. When we mirror space, this term in the Lorentz boost does change sign, which is equivalent to reversing the angle in the boost and giving us the inverse Lorentz boost. When we look at how left and right spinners transform, we know boost transformations equal their own daggers. So we can ignore the dagger here. Now we see that left and right file spinners transform in opposite ways when it comes to boosts, which is what we would expect when we reflect space in a mirror. If we go back to our transformation formula for a vial vector and factor the vial vector into two vial spinners, we see the first spinner transforms with L, so this makes it a left-handed vial spinner. If we take the second half of the formula and transpose it, we see that this spinner transforms with L star, which makes it a right dual spinner. So, a vial vector can be thought of as the outer product of a left-handed vial spinner, whose components are written with upper indices, and a right-handed dual vial spinner, whose components are written with upper dotted indices. As seen in the last video, if the vial vector's determinant is non-zero, we can use the trick shown in the last video to break it up into a sum of four matrices, and then factor each of those into a pair of vial spinners. So in general, a vial vector can be written as a linear combination of tensor products of left vial spinners and right dual vial spinners. In the last video we saw that a linear map called sigma transforms a three-dimensional vector into a Pauli vector, which lives in the space of spinner dual spinner tensor products. The matrix entries of this linear map sigma are here. Similarly, we can also use a linear map sigma to map a 4D spacetime vector to a vial vector, which lives in the space of left spinner, right dual spinner tensor products. The matrix entries of this linear map are given here. These are called the Infeld van der Waarden symbols. As before, we see that a single tensor index can be converted into two spinner indices using this linear map. The last thing I'll mention in this video is Dirac spinners. When dealing with spin one-half particles in special relativity, we need to keep track of both left chiral and right chiral spinners. When writing them both in column notation, they follow these two different Lorentz transformation rules. It's possible to write the left and right spinners stacked on top of each other like this, as a four-component column called a Dirac spinner. The 4x4 matrix which transforms this Dirac spinner is this block diagonal matrix here, where the upper 2x2 block transforms the left spinner and the lower 2x2 block transforms the right spinner. Dirac spinners show up in the Dirac equation, which describes spin 1 half particles in special relativity. Including both the left and right vial spinners allows for the description of both matter and antimatter spin 1 half particles, but I'm going to leave this discussion for later in this video series. So to conclude this video, I'm just going to review this chart of differences between the Pauli spinners of 3D space and the vial spinners of 4D space-time. In 3D space, we measure physical length, and we rotate vectors with SO3 matrices. In 4D space-time, we measure the space-time interval and rotate vectors with Lorentz transformations SO13.
3D vectors can be written as 2x2 Pauli vectors that rotate with double-sided SU2 matrices. 4D spacetime vectors can be written as 2x2 Weyl vectors and transform with double-sided SL2C matrices. Pauli vectors can be factored into Pauli spinners, which have this inner product, and Weyl vectors can be factored into Weyl spinners, which have this inner product. The concept of chirality does not apply to Pauli spinners, and so we only have spinners and dual spinners. But left and right chirality does apply to Weyl spinners, and so we have left, left dual, right dual, and right Weyl spinners, each with their own different transformation rules. As an exercise, you can take these Weyl spinners and SL2C matrices and see how the matrices act on the spinners. As a bonus, you can try drawing these spinners on the block sphere from video 5. Also, if we assume that these spinners and matrices belong to the left representation, try writing out the left dual, right dual, and right equivalents for these spinners and SL2C matrices.